Our next speaker is uh, from the Netherlands. He um, actually you're from Germany, I think, but you live in the Netherlands, if I'm correct. Uh, that's Professor Sebastian Olma. He's professor of culture and creative industries at Advance, Advance University of Applied Science. And there he works also for the Expertise Center Art, Design and Technology. So um, he's the when we had a, our conversation for the preparation of this uh, debate, you were the first to criticize the concept of cultural and creative industries. But nevertheless, you are a professor in cultural and creative industries. That sums it up, I think. Uh, no, but the, the, maybe I, if I can add a, um, an extra thought is that, uh, and that was also the topic of your PhD, if I um, write, that uh, we, why is it also so difficult to talk about our artistic autonomy is also because we saw the last decennia not only an economization of the cultural, of culture, uh, so uh, an increasing pressure from the economy and neoliberalism, but at the other hand, you see also that there uh, is a kind of culturalization of the economy, uh, the aesthetization of the economy. And therefore, I think uh, uh, with this yeah, broadening of the concept, what is art, culture, and creative industries, that it, is, uh, it makes it even more difficult to talk about artistic autonomy, but also more interesting. So I'd like to give you the floor, Sebastian. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anik, uh, and also Laura for the uh, invitation. Um, a, am I a walking contradiction? Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm a professor of cultural creative industries, uh, and I think you know, it's only logical that the first thing that you do is to criticize your discipline, right? I, I, I think that's lacking from loads of artists uh, you know, today. They uh, we saw, we, we, you know, there's a certain kind of arrogance uh, to the art sector of thinking, oh, you know, we kind of bring the innovation, we bring the new kind of stuff to the rest, you know, of society, but, you know, we don't have to look at ourselves, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I think there will be a bit of a change of gear. Uh, my uh, presentation is entitled Autonomy and Communal Luxury, and I have indeed, I have kind of com composed it as a bit of a, a provocation, I think. Um, uh, like, um, my, uh, the, like the previous speaker already mentioned, that is the question that kind of led to this uh, conference today, and this afternoon we would like to discuss the question, as I understood it, does uh, art artistic autonomy actually exist under the current economic conditions? I want to do this in kind of three ways. Uh, when I first want to look at what it is uh, that we talk about when we talk about artistic autonomy, and for that I think we have to go back about 200 years in history and see, you know, that moment when it emerges. Um, not for kind of, uh, you know, etymological nerdiness, but uh, because that kind of, you know, the notion that formed and still informs our kind of uh, um, ideas of uh, what artistic autonomy is, and then I'm, you know, talking about the broad understanding, not so much the uh, maybe academic one. Then I want to talk about the present, uh, and I want to approach the present in terms of uh, social anesthesia, which I think is the state uh, uh, that we're in at the moment, and then finally come to something that I call uh, a communal luxury as a hopeful, uh, you know, look into the future, uh, you know, and maybe kind of providing some few leads or kind of, um, um, yeah, it traces into something that could lead us into a future that is not necessarily uh, anything to do with, you know, individual artistic autonomy, but kind of could, um, you know, uh, kind of revitalize something of that spirit, I suppose. Uh, yeah, all right, so let's start. Artistic autonomy, right. I want to stress, and that is very important, that autonomy is a historical notion. What that means, or what I want to say by that, is that it is not an ontological notion. It is not something that you know, belongs to art, you know, to art's being. It's something that was invented at a particular uh, moment of time. And therefore, the first question I would like to ask is, if it lets me, 
what were the historical conditions that gave rise, that gave rise sorry, to artistic autonomy. So let's have a very quick look. I mean, I've got 10 minutes for that, so you know, it's not going to be a deep dive into history, but a kind of very kind of quick one. We, have, we are at the end of the late 18th century. And uh, it is a history that seems, it is a kind of moment in history uh, that, is, that seems close. I mean, 200 years are not too far away, but in fact, um, it's, quite, uh, it's quite far away from, we, from where we are. So most of Europe is ruled by monarchs and leaders who kind of control the life of their subjects down to the molecular level, right? So you're fixed in your social station. You oftentimes, you know, you are the property of some duke or, you know, king or whatever. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of simplest decision of life, uh, you know, require, uh, 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 you know, their... Um, um, uh, 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 Exactly, that's the word I was looking for, the approval. Thank you very much. So the, the masses live in serfdom, uh, they are fixed. They, you know, there is, that kind of idea of individuality is not really there in daily life. But at the same time, it's a very tumultuous time, a little bit like our time. The Enlightenment has kind of, uh, you know, almost come to an end. Uh, the Enlightenment, that moment, I mean, I don't have to explain that to you, where uh, uh, you know, the, the, the knowledge uh, is kind of wrestled from the hands of, uh, of nobility uh, and church. As Kant says, you know, human being emerging from that self-imposed uh, immaturity. We also, at the end of the 18th century, have um, all kinds of uh, political uh, revolutions in Europe and the Americas. And, of course, there is the industrial revolution going on at the same time, you know, all this happening, different kind of uh, uh, velocities, different speeds in different places in Europe, but all of that is uh, going on. And uh, the, um, if you will, background of that is, of course, the rise of the bourgeoisie as the, uh, you know, to the kind of dominant, uh, uh, you know, class within European uh, society. But they have to, of course, you know, it, it, again, it's not an even, uh, uh, development and there is quite a bit of conflict going on. This is a, uh, um, a contemporary um, cartoon showing, you know, some the, kind of the third estate throwing off the shackles, uh, you know, getting uh, to the, to to you know grabbing that gun and uh, and and uh, you know noblemen and priests shying uh, away from that. So that is the kind of, if you will, that uh, that that social moment where this is happening. And I think, and I'm not saying anything, I suppose, uh, controversial here, that artistic autonomy, you know, has to, the emergence of artistic autonomy has to be understood in that, uh, in that context. So what has happened is that uh, artistic autonomy emerges at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century as part or kind of co-evolving with the bourgeois struggle, but is also directed against the predominance of reason and rational thought, right, that the Enlightenment had uh, declared. So it's kind of making that, that move along uh, with, um, you know, kind of going along with that, uh, with that bourgeois uh, impetus, uh, with that political impetus, but also saying, well, wait, you know, there's something else. There's not just reason and, uh, and, and, and science, there's also the imagination. That is what someone like Jacques Rancière and others call the aesthetic revolution. The emancipation of aesthetics as a social system, you know, in itself with its own rules and codes. And I, what I'm saying is, and also that is not controversial, is that we have to think this alongside the uh, struggle uh, for the, you know, uh, individual and more specifically for the for the um, you know, autonomy of of the artist. So the bourgeois is liberated, but the genius you know, as well, if you will. That's if you want to put it like that. The, um, the um, geographical nexus or kind of focus uh, or center where this is uh, kind of happening, that kind of thought, that kind of, um, yeah, the, where these concepts are prepared is, the, uh, kind of, is a um, southeastern corner of Germany, somewhere in between uh, Jena uh, and, and Weimar, I suppose, the intellectual center of this struggle. Um, the reason why it's there has to do with the fact that Germany kind of lags behind a little bit in its historical development and therefore 
uh, you know, it, it, it's not as unified as, as a place like France or uh, Britain. You know, there are loads of uh, fiefdom uh, and duchies, and, and so it, it's more difficult to censor, right? And so there's also a very liberal duke uh, in uh, Weimar Saxony. And so, you know, you get all these fantastic, amazing people there, uh, you know, starting to work on the invention of the self, opening the door to the inner world of effect and emotion, which wasn't something, you know, that, that, that existed before that, really. In a way, kind of they're filling, from the artistic side, they're kind of filling the vacancy left by the death of God with the idea and practice of the uh, creative uh, genius. You know, you have, um, you have philosophers, I mean, these, the, most of them are kind of thinkers and artists at the same time, but they're also there. On, the, on the left here, there's um, Fichte, a big philosopher, the philosopher of the, you know, of the self, the ich, the ich is what, what creates everything. Yeah, that uh, and next to him is um, uh, the, uh, Caroline, no, Dorothea Veit, uh, August Wilhelm Schelling. You know, the, the 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 philosopher who defined the kind of relation between nature, uh, reason, and art. Uh, Novalis, uh, the uh, the 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 poet. Um, also, uh, Caroline Schelling, uh, Friedrich, August, uh, Friedrich and August Schlegel, I mean, it's just Friedrich, I think, and, uh, and Schiller there. So these, so these people really kind of codified uh, uh, the, the idea of, of artistic autonomy by thinking about, you know, by exploring the kind of inner life, by, uh, you know, kind of really pushing the idea of, of free will, of um, self-determination, uh, of, uh, yeah, really that, 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 that kind of creative genius, you know, that we need uh, in, in that kind of romantic uh, period in order to, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, establish that artistic autonomy as something that they develop and there are more, but there's Goethe is not in there, uh, uh, Hölderlin is not, uh, there, there are loads of, but there was this really this kind of uh, uh, concentration of brain power in that little corner in uh, what today is Thuringia. And, uh, and, and there are loads of great books on this. The reason why I uh, thought I plugged this is because it's a, it's, a, it's a new publication by someone who is really kind of, you know, looking at the role of women and particularly at the role of uh, Caroline Schelling in this because, I mean, if this autonomy, you know, was a struggle for, for, the, for, for you know, for men, and it was, then, I mean, for these women, it's just, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, the, the, these were characters uh, that it's just, you know, at the, at the time when you, you know, were chastised for just being alone in a room with a man as a woman, I mean, they were living, I mean, totally emancipated lives, right? And that meant a constant struggle. I mean, it, it's unimaginable today, I think, you know, how, how, how that worked. I mean, you know, prison, you know, children dying, I mean, it, it's just, the, the, the challenge, uh, and, and it's very interesting that you know, you know, we're getting a kind of view into that uh, by this um, book. So my the point I'm trying to make is that uh, by you know, kind of trying to develop an ideology that goes not just against that movement, uh, not that moves not just against you know the kind of old regime of uh, of church and state, but also is uh, is kind of trying to be a corrective to. Um, uh, to, you know, to the kind of enlightenment ideology that, that comes with the bourgeoisie and, and says, you know, we also need the imagination. What I'm saying is that um, by doing so, that artistic autonomy should be understood as a countercultural movement, right? And that's why uh, my uh, designer, uh, Ananya Panda, uh, put that punk uh, uh, wanderer on the, on the rock. I mean, one thing that we should have done as well, I think, is to I don't know if you remember these banners I, I, I don't know if they exist in uh, in uh, in Belgium as well that kind of made a mogelijk gemaakt door the kraakbeweging uh, you know, made possible by I think there should be I mean, because one you know, made possible by the market because at that time the market was a very um, a, you know emancipatory uh, 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 mechanism if you will right. Because the, the 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 reason why they even could engage in these kind of you know activities and thinking and so on was also because there was a market that was just emerging, but but that stimulated the, the development of civil society and and the public sphere, and therefore you know made it possible for people to you know for instance flee you know their duke like, like someone like Schiller did. 
uh, because they're suddenly, you know, they, these the books were sold, the journals were sold, uh, public and, and, and uh, private institutions around the arts emerged that made it possible for people to, ma to, to make some money and kind of leave that, that old order. So at that time, um, I would argue uh, the market was a mechanism for emancipation, right, against this old order. Um, so then, how is it today? Uh, I think it's a little bit different. Um, this is one of the greatest, uh, you probably know this, right? Uh, art collections in the world. It's uh, the Freeport in Geneva, hosting 1.2 million um, you know, great artworks. Um, why is it there? Because you don't have to pay tax for your... Uh, For your, for your, you know, purchase for your commodity, and um, there's a little quote by uh, the artist Tito Stahl there, from you know, who wrote about this. Uh, I learned it from from her like some uh, six, seven years ago. Um, so most of contemporary art and also kind of old masters are hidden in this these kind of spaces around the world. They're usually you know located next to next to an airport, so they can be. You know they can move uh, quickly in and out. Uh, I think the uh, the Swedish artist uh, Jonas Lund made uh, turned that into an art project uh, some years ago when he tagged some of his paintings and kind of mapped that uh, you know the movement of this uh, of the uh, well of, of of his work. So so that is that is kind of a I don't know is that the best way uh, to deal uh, with great art? Um, what what it definitely is. I, I, I would say it's, you know, you, you could approach it as a form of autonomy, right? It's just, an, well, the art, art becomes totally autonomous. I mean, I mean mainly uh, autonomous from, uh, from social life and discourse. Uh, it gets degraded to an abstract means of investment, right? Something that can be moved. Uh, it's never seen by anyone, but, uh, you know, a potential buyer. Uh, and by doing so, it becomes a, a part of really the, the structure of um, contemporary extractive capitalism. And what I mean by that is, and uh, you know, the, the, the art market is not that big, you know, in terms of financial volume, but because it's totally you know, uncontrolled, if you, wars, racism, whatever, you know, can be financed with it, right? because there's so, so little control. And uh, that photo that you see here is from Christopher Nolan's uh, Tenet, and, I, and, and what I thought was that um, what he did in that film was quite brilliant because he, he put that, I mean, the utter nonsense the film, but, uh, you know, he put a time machine in that, uh, in that Freeport. So next to these, uh, uh, you know, paintings and so on and so on, you, you've got this time machine that plays a role in that film. And I thought, okay, so, you know, it, it, the art has become so abstract, right, that it's almost, you know, like time, this abstraction that structures our social life. Uh, as capital, uh, uh, you know, art also becomes this, uh, you know, enormous abstraction. I wanted to, to someone who has recently uh, kind of radicalized that uh, critique is uh, the editor of Texte zur Kunst, that many of you will know, uh, uh, Isabel Gras. Um, she talks about um, the uh, resortization uh, of art. And what she means is, um, is, again, I mean, it's like a, it kind of goes on on that, uh, you know, concentration uh, or even retraction of art, uh, you know, from you know normal society. And for for her, she she developed six theses there. Um, it's about art, kind of uh, re, you know, kind of redrawing into this, um, retracting into that uh, uh, dig space of digital showrooms where it becomes, I mean, you know, quite abstracted from uh, from its you know, the social context of its making. Uh, you know, there's loads of uh, you know Instagram and that kind of uh, you know showrooms uh, who, who 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 do that, and it's very interesting that that happens at the very moment when, you know, the context of. Uh, Colonial and so on, uh, you know, of art becomes uh, so important elsewhere, you know, in the in the art world. Big galleries opening branches in luxury and luxury resorts like at the, you know Aspen, the Hamptons, Monaco. She even talks about a new mode of value production because, I, you know, probably a few you know art critics here, uh, academics and so on and so on. I mean, they're totally uh, excluded from that uh, from from the kind of you know value formation of the 
of the art because the only thing that counts is the political uh, the, sorry the potential gain of uh, of a sale so it, it does also something to the kind of you know art public uh, if you will um yeah and of course you know that all works as a kind of further extraction of art from uh, the public sphere and what we have to, I mean, it's, so again, you know, and that happens at the very moment that we also see biennials becoming very political. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the question of opening up um, collections, of diversification, of, uh, you know, integrating non-Western uh, and de decolonial and, uh, and underprivileged practices and discourses is there, you know. And uh, one uh, really good example of that, I mean, I don't know if it's good, but it's an int a very, very, extremely interesting example of that is that documentary that just came out a few months ago, uh, uh, where you know, the white balls on walls, right? And 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 if you haven't watched it, uh, I think it's still in the NOS uh, uh, kind of media thing. Um, it, it's 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 really revealing in so many ways and and it's it's it, it, it's a really really um, you know important film um to watch to see the kind of complexities and intricacies and particularly i think what it does um and that's also what grass says is that we have to be if we want to take this seriously you know that opening uh, decolonizing and so on of the art world then we then we also we have to look we cannot we cannot not look at the uh, you know economic economic structure of the art world because what we then do is that we kind of produce cosmetic changes or kind of theme art right so you know you make sure that they, that, that in a kind of corrupt financial uh, construction you know you have this you have this very radical art that then might end up you know in one of those uh, free ports and find in some kind of warlords you know racial war or whatever right so I mean, that's an extreme example, right? But it, it's obvious if you really want to open the art world, you can't do this by kind of shying away from the, oh, you know, oh, we're going to diversify our collection, but we're not going to look at the rest, uh, you know, of what we're doing here. So, yeah, right. And uh, so we, what, what we could say is, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, that's fine. We kind of, we're aware of this, and this is all part of um, kind of the neoliberalization of our societies. But I think it's also something to do with uh, public policy. And I think he, this is where it gets interesting for, uh, I think, cultural managers, because I think partly it's you who have, to, um, who have to correct this. So what has happened over the last 25, 30 years, and this is a book we've recently translated uh, from uh, Justin O'Connor, um, the implementation of the creative industries, I think, has, has caused enormous harm you know, to to the uh, well to, to art and culture why because it implement it implemented an economic reductionism and uh, i'm just very quickly going to read that uh, economic reductionism imposes a reductive model of human behavior and value derived from neoclassical and neoliberal economics in which utility maximization is the primary goal of every individual with free markets the best way to satisfy the express preferences such a model of human behavior and the good life has been applied to all aspects of our private and public lives but also yeah okay its mode of understanding has deeply embedded itself in our institutions and our imaginations and the reality it evokes has become as immutable as the laws of physics our understanding of art and culture have not escaped this gravitational pull and perhaps has been captured more completely than many other areas of public policy and i th and i think and i think he is right so so you know, the first, if we want to change the art world, I think we have to leave that behind, that creative industries nonsense, that kind of looking at art from an economic point of view is just, sorry, from a market point of view is just, uh, is just wrong. And what we have seen, you know, it's really, I mean, the, yeah, it, this is Schiller, right? Schiller giving a TED talk. And I think, you know, that for me, that really summarizes some, what the creative industries have done, because they have taken that romantic notion of autonomy, of the genius, and said, well, oh, you know, we invite artists into the economy and they're going to make it colorful, they're going to make it innovative, and so on and so on and so on. None of that has happened, of course, anywhere, right? But it has damaged our imaginary of what art is, what artists do, and, uh, and what the purpose of art is. And, and we have to, I think we have to work on, uh, on correcting that. 
part, this is, um, yeah, just very, uh, this is, I, I think, the most important film of the last 40 years is uh, Ridley Scott's 1984 Apple Macintosh commercial, um, where that kind of, where that kind of subject, that entrepreneurial subjectivity has been uh, codified. Mark Fisher called it a, a, an exercise in dream engineering. Uh, it, what it does is codifying the ideological superior, superiority of networked individualism over the supposed grey conformity of collective and bureaucratic organization. I haven't got the time uh, to show you this, but if you don't know this, you have to know it. All right, it's a very, very important uh, uh, historical um, document. I mean, another another part of this um, story is. Uh, that, uh, that, you know, silic the role that Silicon Valley played in this, um, the promise of freedom and creativity through digital technology, which, which in many ways has been the model of the creative industries. The Social Dilemma, again, is a film that you have to watch, and if you haven't watched it, do watch it with your children. It's a brilliant film, particularly because there's loads of developers in there, you know, people who have developed the, you know, like button and so on and so on. And at the end of the film, they, they, they kind of ask uh, how much, how much, screen time do your children get? And all of them say zero, right? I mean, so they're not allowed on social media from the people who created that. Why? Because it, it, has, it has been, you know, destroying. I mean, for one, it's kind of expropriating the content, uh, you know, of, of, of artists, uh, you know, and, and create, you know, creators. Um, well, the, yeah, it's expropriated by global media conglomerates. There is that ex <laughs> constant extraction of uh, what Shushana Zuboff, uh, Harvard uh, business professor, calls um, behavioral surplus, behavioral surplus by the big, big data companies. And there is a perpetual psychic and social manipulation by social media that we are exposed to. And I mean, taking all these things together, right? I, I don't see where this autonomy is coming from on a kind of individual level. Where, 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 I don't know, right? So, yeah, I find it problematic. So, okay, but then what do we do? Um, one of the things that has been done is, of course, uh, the last uh, documenta, which I think was, uh, was an absolute pleasure uh, to visit. Um, at the same time, not everyone uh, agrees, and uh, and 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 I mean, you know, I, of course, so much as much can be said about it. Um, the uh, the 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 anti-Semitism anti anti-Semitism reproach and so on and so on. But okay, so despite all the uh, misunderstandings, breakdown of communication, and so on, what they what they've done is to share with us a uh, crucial perspective. Um, from the Southern Hemisphere on the, necess on the, on the, on the necess necessity of opening the institutional art world uh, by posing the question of economics, of, of the economy, because the Lumbung, that, that principle, is an economic principle, right? The, the uh, I mean, I, I suppose you're all familiar and you're probably even aware at the uh, at the documenta about that you know communal rice barn as the model for collective sharing of the pleasures of aesthetic production and experience i mean that is that is a uh, in essence you know an economic an economic question so what was interesting i think you know for 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 us as europeans is also that um, that focus on process and the conditions of uh, of work, you know, rather than than you know what we call had built, right? In uh, in in Dutch, uh, the, the 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 image or the work, um, which is uh, which would have been which would have made, I think, for a very interesting um, exchange. But because of uh, uh, the scandalizing and all that, that uh, didn't happen. And it also, I think, revealed the 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 the, the ferocious reaction of uh, particularly the German art world. Uh, revealed that arrogance, I think, uh, of, uh, of, um, yeah, of that kind of European art world of saying, look, you know, we can help all the other social subsystems, uh, you know, to to change their ways, but we don't have to look at, uh, you know, the the way we organize ourselves uh, economically. Now, someone, okay, so that. 
conversation didn't take place, but somebody kind of started it anyway. And that, again, is my friend uh, uh, Justin O'Connor, who has just written a book that will be published in... Um, in uh, early next year, in February, I think, uh, who's looking at that from, a, he's a Brit, but he lives in, um, in Australia. Uh, so so, so what he's, he takes loads of these, um, of these uh, you know, post-colonial feminist and so on critiques on, on in order to then kind of uh, you know, develop a form of cultural policy that he believes, or the, you know, a concept of that, that he believes is, is very implemented, uh, you know, uh, kind of usable, implementable, and um, you know, can, could basically be done uh, if we had the uh, political opportunity to do so, uh, which of course we haven't. But um, let's have a look at what he is doing. So he's he. So what he says is, if you want to change art and culture, you have to look at the economy first. It's not. You know, there's no use in saying the economy. You know, we, that's not what we do, right? Be, instead, we have to say, for, no, no, we have, to, we have to start with the economy, but with a different kind of economy, okay? And uh, so it's really, really, we, we, as we cannot, you know, um, afford to shy away from the question of economy. That's what he's saying. And he's looking for, you know, what is called heterodox uh, approaches. So no, non-classical, non-neoclassical approaches to to the economy. I mean, you've all heard about Kate Ray with Donut Economics, uh, Marina Mazzucato's Mission Economy. But you know what he is particularly interested in is what is called the Foundational Economy um, uh, uh, Collective, and he and that is very interesting. I think also for um, cultural managers because. What it does is it says, look, there isn't just one economy and that's the market. What, there are different economic zones. And that green one uh, is the trade of economy, which is the kind of the market, the com commercial part, which in most countries makes about 40% of the entire economy. Okay. And uh, then, of course, you know, there's family and community, but, you know, leave that aside. So the foundational economy and the overlooked economy, which sometimes are also kind of put together, that is... Um, we're kind of, you know, material infrastructure, energy, water, housing, public, private transport, and so on and so on. And also what they call prudential, providential services, education, health, social community service, prison, police, and so on, it takes place, right? So, so what they're arguing for is to blow up that sector, that, you know, that, that, but, but not as a kind of, you know, welfare state policy, but as an economic policy, because what it does is that... Um, it, uh, it, it kind of centers the economy locally, right? I mean, if you, if, if you invest uh, in, uh, you know, in, in community services like health and so on and so on, right? Uh, that is money that, that keeps on circulating in your, in your uh, uh, well, polis or in, uh, you know, in your city, in your region and so on and so on. And it's not, this is not something that is, um, that is, you know, cooked up by by some kind of lefty, you know, uh, crazy visionary. But it's something that, the, before, and for instance, you know, the 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 the, the Scottish uh, government, uh, you know, is trying to implement with what they call community wealth building. Mm -hmm. Community, you know, check that our community. I mean, sometimes it can it, that can also be problematic, like with all kind of new things. But um, so, so so this is, a, I think. A kind of very very practical approach to um, to criticize uh, creative industries by uh, kind of saying okay uh, no okay forget about it I was going too fast so this is so what they are trying to do is to say the the um, the foundational economy people what they are trying to say is to say we have to pull as much as possible you know back into the foundational economy if you think that our you know many of our kind of profitable uh, health clinics like heart stuff and so on and so on you know are run by international uh, capital investment firms that's utterly unnecessary. Why do we have people coming into our kind of community, you know, service, health, and so on and so on, and extract all that money? That's not necessary. We can run them ourselves. We can finance them and grow that kind of, you know, community wealth uh, uh, or foundational um, economy. Now, what O'Connor does, and I mean, have a look at the book, um, uh, not at that book, but uh, but but Justin's, uh, because he really kind of spells it out and. He goes on and, and says that art and culture should also be part of that foundational economy. And, um, and, that, that, and so, you know, he kind of uh, conjugates uh, all the different, all kinds of different forms of activities and so on and so on um, of art and culture in these, uh, you know, transactional, everyday, providential, the, mat 
uh, no, sorry, the material, providential, and everyday, and then the transactional would would be uh, what happening, what's happening at the at the market. But even there, you know, they talk about licensing yeah. markets, right? So you 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 would uh, you know allow. Uh, certain sectors to operate as a market, but only under you know kind of certain rules and uh, and as they say uh, licenses. All right. Um, the um, the why 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 is he why does he want to why does he suggest that? Um, you know this, the idea of course is is having art and culture as a kind of basic service. I mean that is something that is very very difficult to I think imagine, particularly you know also with our uh, kind of current you know, national, regional, uh, and municipal governments, but the idea, you know, try to entertain it. I don't know. I mean, it, 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 the point of it anyway is um, to come from a situation where we only have these resorts, these islands, uh, you know, of art, to you know, a, 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 a kind of situation of uh, that we call communal luxury, where really kind of art and culture. Uh, gets kind of recharged through the uh, social fabric, and um, and um, the um, the what Justin and I have done recently is we've uh, published uh, a new um, issue, and maybe someone could uh, put this on the of our technical team of uh, the journal Making and Breaking, where we've um, invited. Artists, designers, academics, entrepreneurs, to reflect on the notion of communal luxury uh, and share the experience of trying to create the conditions of it. Because I think that that some kind of uh, you know communal or collective or you know approach to art and design, uh, sorry, to art and culture is um, is necessary if we want to come back to a. I mean, I think that you know that 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 kind of freedom, that risk, that kind of insecurity, that um, that that individual autonomy once um, you know allowed for, uh, is something that we can only regain collectively. You know, we do, this is it's impossible to do that on your own uh, today. I, I I don't I don't I don't I don't think it can be done. Um, and I want to close. With um, okay, you know that was kind of your homework, uh, if you will. Uh, what uh, you have to do as uh, cultural managers, I think, uh, or be the one possible answer to the question, uh, you know, what can we do if we really want to make sure uh, art and culture, in you know, in a, in a, in the sense that is more than just decoration, right, uh, has a future. Then I think you know you've got your work cut out. But what I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, close on is that example from um, the uh, Art College St. Joost, um, where I work in uh, in Brabant uh, in 2018. Our bachelor student decided to, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of design their uh, end of year show, their graduation show, as a musical, as a way of kind of resisting this um, commercialization uh, star system. And so on uh, uh, by right. Um, what they did, so they said, look, look instead of uh, opening a, uh, a show where everyone can just c come and go as they please, and you know galleries can select works. No, we want to have um, we want to have our sovereignty. So what we do, we only sell tickets to a number of shows, and these shows were musicals. Uh, they were called musicals because they were kind of mixed uh, uh, presentations, five acts, acts and five scenes. They they, uh, they presented collectively. They limited the tickets. Uh, they, they you could you could only view works uh, with a guide, and you had to also request. So uh, there was a. It's really interesting because it's uh, there was a high risk that your work wouldn't be shown also as a you know as part of the collective and there were a part of the uh, of the students who said no we don't want that we want our work to be shown so they got their got an extra room so they were, so they were also playing with the uh, with the the kind of problems and challenges and risks uh, involved in you know doing a uh, collective show by the way that was in 2018 eh? that was before that entire discussion i think even started uh, on uh, before collectivity i think became hip um, yeah, they worked with that notion of individual status reduction, which I think is quite interesting, uh, uh, particularly you know for these you know very young 
um, uh, uh, yeah, students. Um, and I thought that was uh, that was that was very hopeful. You know, the the I think. I'm not saying that this is a solution, and they also didn't want to present this as some kind of solution. And we haven't had a, a, a graduation show like that, uh, 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 you know, since then. But um, I think that this is the, again, you know, some. I, I would wish uh, from kind of you know the artist community for a bit more than that. And uh, before I entirely melt here in that uh, uh, light, I. Uh, I think I, uh, I leave it at that, and thank you for your uh, attention. <laughs> Maybe one last thing. Um, you know, an argument for the foundational economy I experienced today. I went to the train station this morning to Amsterdam Central to hear that there's no uh, uh, trains coming in and out. I mean, this is a... This is a um, this is a foundational service. This is communication, right? This is something that we need and that has been privatized. Uh, then I come here. I've worked last week with uh, with that designer Ananya Panya to make a beautiful presentation. And in spite of the great competence, you know, of everyone, you know, of the technical people involved here, I couldn't give that presentation. So we made it into a PDF. So I'm saying, you know, there, there are real kind of consequences to these things that I said here. And I mean, it's not the end of the world. It's fine. And I would have sweat anyway, right? Uh, but uh, but the, uh, the yeah, I just uh, thought I mentioned that. Thank you very much. Uh.